Final two episodes of The Dynasty are now available on Apple TV Plus. The focus, the power struggle between Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, and Robert Kraft in their final years together. Matthew Slater detailing just how bad things got between Belichick and Brady, saying, quote, Tom and Bill weren't best of buds. During our captain's meeting, we would kind of go around and we'd talk about the game plan, and every time coach goes to Tom, you know, there's awkward silence and tension there that you could feel. And I'm thinking to myself, dang, let me slide back. I don't want to get in the crossfire. I remember times like if Tom wanted something done, he would tell me to go tell Bill. And I'm looking at Tom like, Tom, I'm not telling Bill. You tell Bill. And that dysfunction led to this conversation. When we walked into the room, he said, I've decided to move on. And as soon as he said it, he started crying. And his crying told me everything I needed to know. He said, I think we should call Bill. And then when Bill answered, it was emotional. Um, it's because, again, it was a chapter coming to an end. And, uh, and I expressed that to Bill, too. I would say that's kind of what I expected. Um, but you know, there's, you know, always kind of the, you know, saying goodbye is always hard. Um, and, you know, I, I, loved, I loved coaching Tom, loved having him on our football team, but at that point in time, um, I think he made the right and the best decision. Life is very imperfect, and relationships are imperfect, but I'm very proud of our journey. It was hard, but, um, but it was great. Fascinating insight just like that throughout episodes 9 and 10. And a reminder, all 10 episodes of The Dynasty are now available on Apple TV+. Plus. Phil Perry here, Michael Hawley, Tom Curran, both featured at the end of The Dynasty. And we have now somebody who was with the Patriots through that 2017 season and beyond, Brian Hoyer. Brian, thank you so much for being with us. How, how weird was it in 2017? That's what a lot of episode 9 covers. You had been with the team 09 through 11 how different were things in 2017 when you walked into the facility? Yeah, I mean, thanks for having me first off. And, uh, you know, I came in right in the middle of that year. That was part of that Jimmy Garoppolo trade and um, and came back. And, and I was excited to come back because, uh, you know, for me, I always considered myself a patriot. I learned a lot and I came back and, and it was pretty noticeable right off the bat that, you know, tensions were high and, and um, it – wasn't the same as what it was when I had left. Brian, from the outside looking in, and you were very close to it, why did the relationship mainly deteriorate? I have my own feelings from having observed it, that Tom wanted to kind of self-actualize, and Bill said, well, that's still not how we do things around here, no matter who you are. But from your vantage point watching it, why did it just get worse and worse and worse? Well, the thing that hit me, and I, and I watched the show today for the first time, was when Mr. Brady, Tom's dad, says, you know, you just know when you're not appreciated. And I think that was the biggest sense I got as Tom's backup and his friend was that he didn't feel appreciated. And I think, you know, when you see people like Matt Slater and Devin McCourty and Danny Amendola, and you see those guys talking about, you know, how Tom was treated, and having been there, you know, from 09 to 11 and, um, you know, witnessing that relationship and then coming back and seeing that it was, you know, I would say deteriorating and worse and the lack of communication that went on in some of those meetings and Tom would just sit there and shake his head and say, OK. And, um, you know, I think that was it. He, was, he wanted to feel appreciated. He didn't want to you know, be put above other guys. I think Tom, mm -hmm. a big part of what made him so endearing is he wanted to just be one of the guys. But, he, you know, you can only take so much for so long. And I think he always looked at it as if I can sit there and take it, then everybody else can too. And I set the example. But at a certain point, I would say it got worse before it ever got better. Brian, you saw Tom Brady at, at different points of his career, at different MVP seasons. So the different iterations of Tom Brady. And at and, and one point in the documentary, I think it was episode eight, where Robert Kraft tells the story of, hey, Bill would come into my office with these stats about how Brady was starting to lose it and downfield throws 
uh, at the bottom of the league. What did you see from Tom Brady, just quarterbacking, forget about the personality stuff, between 2011 and, say, 2017? I mean, in my opinion, he was better. He was better in 2017, 2018 than what I had remembered in 2009 through 2011. And I think the thing about quarterbacking is, is, um, you know, and obviously Tom's the greatest quarterback of all time, but your brain continues to develop and get better at it. And so if your body can withhold the beating and the day in, day out, um, you're a, you should get better as you go. And, and, and it's my opinion that had Tom played last year, he'd be a top 10 quarterback. That's just who he is. That's the knowledge he has of the game. And I think that kind of alludes to the, the friction with Alex Guerrero, because I think Tom looked at Alex like, this guy is going to allow me to play as long as I want to, as long as I can. And to have that, you know, become an issue, that was a big thing too, I think. You know, and having gone through and get, gotten treatment at TB12, um, you know, it was, a, it was a career saver for me. It added three years to my career because – I was dealing with knee issues and going in and getting that treatment. And, you know, you'd see the guys that go in, they'd be a little skeptical. They get one treatment and you'd be like, wow, I feel better. And I think Tom was like, I'm doing whatever I can to help this team win by staying healthy and, and have an Alex there to give me this treatment. And now you're trying to make it difficult for me to go, go out and do that. How awkward was that situation with, with Alex Guerrero, Brian, because it seemed as though watching episodes nine and 10 here that, that really created a rift or it exposed the rift. Brady was clearly very emotional about everything that went down with Alex. How awkward was it from your vantage point? Yeah, it was strange to me. I mean, I, I can't remember, you know, what stint it was with the team, but I remember going to get treatment from Alex and I walk in the room and he's treating Bill. And so, you know, <laughs> here he is and, and he's getting treatment from the guy. And, and it could have very well been like in 2011. I don't know if that would have been in 2017 because of the, where the friction was. But, you know, I think he saw the benefits of what that was. And, you know, talk about awkward. I remember, you know, getting ready for a game and, and you know, we got to go out on the field for warmups in 20, 30 minutes. And I haven't seen Tom for an hour and a half because he would have to go up to his private suite just to get treatment from from Alex. So, you know, it caused, you know, more issues than, you know, it, it, it did. than if you just left it alone. Was Alex kind of a chew toy that Tom liked that Bill decided to withhold from him, kind of tease him with? I mean, it was I mean, an I easy way. I don't for know. I mean, we're talking about grown men dealing with, yeah. you know, this situation. And I always kind of looked at it like, this is so silly. I mean, I always sat in those meetings and I looked and I'm like, this is the greatest coach of all time. And this is the greatest quarterback of, of all time. How fortunate I am to be in these meetings and learn from both of these guys. But I also, at the same time, it was like, the tension was sometimes it, it was, you know, I remember trying to lighten up the room and I'd ask Bill questions about Cleveland, having grown up in Cleveland, like, hey, you know, what was it like, you know, when you were coaching in Cleveland and Art Modell and and Tom liked that because it kind of would eat up some of that time and take away from that awkwardness. And, um, you know, I always thought it was just sad. I'm like, these guys are tied at the hip forever. You know, when one gets inducted to the Hall of Fame, the other one will be there. And, and you see it and you see how emotional Tom gets at the end. And it was an amazing journey and it just – you know, like all good things, um, you know, relationships aren't easy. Brian, you were, you were with the Patriots to start the 2019 season. The dynasty basically skips over Brady's final season in New England in 2019, yeah. but things were plenty awkward, then including this memorable bite from Brady when asked about his contract situation. I feel like you're on an extension, Tom? Have I earned it? I don't know. You guys, that's up for talk show debate. What do you guys think? Should we take a, should we take a poll? Sure. All right. Talk to Mr. Kraft. Come on. This was a fascinating <laughs> time period for the Patriots because as that was going on, Tom really wanted just a two-year, $50 million contract. Easy for me to say. Same as Drew Brees. <laughs> and when he didn't get it, that sealed it. I spoke to people very close to him, and they said, that's it. You were within the organization. It was told to me by folks within the coaching staff that, they actually had to go to Bill and say, look, he's going to leave the team if you don't do something about this, Bill. And Bill was kind of caught unawares. From your vantage point, what were indicators that you got that Tom was up to his eyeballs with the 2019 contract situation? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know that that was, you know, really the rumblings around the building. But I remember one day Tom coming to me and being like, hey, babe, just just be ready to play the whole year. And I remember being like, did you what happened? Did you get hurt? What's, what's going on? He said, I just... I just want to prepare you. And, and he kind of left it at that. 
And I, I don't know if you all remember, there was a day in training camp that year where he didn't practice. And I got all the reps because at the time it was just me and, and, and Stidham. And, um, you know, the next day he had that new contract. And I think at that point it was more about being able to become a free agent after that year than it was getting that contract like you mentioned. So you, you, he said be ready to play the whole year. Do you get the, the, the feeling that he was ready to just to walk out and, and see what happened from there? I mean, at the time, I didn't, I didn't know that. But, you know, watching this show and hearing Tom talk about what he had heard, I mean, it sounds like that was surely the plan. Because then when you watch the show and he, you know, we've won the Super Bowl and he basically said, I'm not, I'm not willing to go through it again like this. I mean, I did not know it was to that extent. And um, like I said, that was cleared up pretty quickly because it was one day where he didn't practice. And then, you know, the contract was, the new contract was signed and he was back out there. But, um, you know, I left a few weeks later to go to Indianapolis. So um, I know that, you know, that was a rough year for him. I think they started off, you know, what was it 10 and 0, 11 and 0. And mm -hmm. I, it just, you could see, you know, being a friend, I would watch their games and you could just see there was no joy for him. Really fascinating stuff there for Brian Hoyer. Brian, do not go anywhere. Oh, We're keeping you around for the next segment coming up. We continue to break down where it all went wrong with Brady, Belichick, and Kraft. Plus, is Brian as angry as some of his former teammates with Bill Belichick for benching Malcolm Butler in the Super Bowl? It's all coming up on the Dynastic Post Show. Stick around. Welcome back to the Dynastic Post Show. Robert Kraft in Episode 9 revealing as much as anyone has about why Malcolm Butler got benched in the Super Bowl. Quote, what has been told to me was that there was something personal going on between Bill and Malcolm that was not football related. I always felt that every decision Bill had made had been put, uh, had been to put what was in the best interest of the team first and put emotion aside. But with Malcolm, he did just the opposite. With that, we welcome back Brian Hoyer, who was with the team for the end of that 2017 season and that Super Bowl that Robert Kraft is referencing right there. Uh, this would be the time now, Brian, for you to tell us all, tell the <laughs> world why Malcolm Butler was benched. So you could just, we'll, we, you have Bring to Bring it on. Man, I tried, I asked him when he came back, what was that in 2022? I remember he and I were doing a little, you know, rehab recovery down running. I said, come on, Malcolm, just tell me what it was. And he goes, man, I can't. I'm just like, the, like in the show. He goes, I still don't know. And, um, you know, for me, I, I, like I said, I had come back midway through that season. And, um, you know, it's a Super Bowl. I'm so focused on the offense that I don't even think a lot of us knew what was going on until the end of the game that there were some rumblings on the sideline. Like, yo, Malcolm hasn't played at all. And everyone, I mean, I'm, 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 I was a scout team quarterback that week. He was in on all the reps. Um, he was covering, you know, the slot receiver on third down. I remember, I remember him breaking up a pass and thinking, man, that was a really good play. Like Malcolm's, you know, good to go. And, um, you know, so to this day, it remains the biggest mystery, you know, in, in Super Bowl history, probably. Not just a mystery in Super Bowl history, but also something that has people still, more importantly than people, players on that team, still rankled to a high degree. Did Bill, in hindsight, punt on a Lombardi? I mean, look, I, I, football's the ultimate team sport. Could Malcolm have helped us win? No doubt. I mean, to say that one guy was going to alter the impact of that game, that's putting a lot of pressure on Malcolm and, to, and taking away from a lot of the guys that were on the field. But that's a huge what if. And I think, um, you know, you see the reactions from a lot of the guys, the Danny Amendola's, the Gronks, the Devons, the Slaters. Um, obviously, they had a lot more invested in that year and with Malcolm because – you know, they were there that whole year. Malcolm had won them a Super Bowl three years before. So, you know, they have every right to be angry and, and sit there and say, what if? I mean, you look at what the offense did in that game. I mean, it was historic numbers offensively. And we just, I remember Josh, you know, saying, we just got to get ahead of them at some point and we'll be okay. But we could never just catch up. And I think a lot of those guys have every right to feel the way they feel because you were never given an explanation and it's a huge what if. All right, you said a lot of those guys have a right to feel that way. You were on the team, so were you angry or are you angry about it when you think, hey, I could have had another ring? I mean, I, great. That would have been great because I went to three Super Bowls and only was on a one winning team, so I would have loved to have another Super Bowl ring. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm angry per se. Like I said, I, I was only there for the la last half of the season. I, I didn't invest the, the blood, sweat, and tears the same way those guys did with, that, with their team at Malcolm. I mean, I barely knew Malcolm at that point. So, um, you know, am I angry? I, I don't say I'm angry. I guess I'm, I'm 
you know, you're regretful of, you know, what could have happened. I guess that's that's more, you know, likely how I would put it. All right, uh, Brian, you were, as you mentioned, you were part of that Super Bowl winning team against the Rams uh, after Belichick benched Butler in the Super Bowl, uh, in Super Bowl 52, excuse me. Robert Kraft said he was keeping a close eye on Bill Belichick during that Super Bowl <laughs> okay. against the Rams. All right. Watch out, Bill. <laughs> What's up with this zone? He said, uh, we haven't played this all year. He said, quote, I thought after winning that Super Bowl, what an amazing job our defensive staff did under the leadership of Bill, obviously allowing just three points in that game. So if I ever thought Bill was losing it, Kraft continued, as a head coach and couldn't perform, he had reestablished himself. At that point, Tommy understood that Bill would be the head coach for a number of years moving forward. Brian, do you feel as though Bill Belichick was coaching for his job in that Super Bowl against the Rams? Because that's sort of how Kraft made it sound at that point in the documentary. Yeah, I don't think any of us ever felt that way about that game. Um, I don't. I, I certainly didn't. You know, I felt like Bill would be there for a long time after the game, no matter what had happened. So, um, you know, that's hard to speculate. I, I don't ever think you know any of us had that feeling. How about the series overall? Uh, you know, there have been a lot of. Uh, comments on it, Brian. People feel about, hey, they didn't too much, fo not enough football, too much drama. They missed that. They skipped over that. They skipped over two championships, two championships back to back. Belichick yeah. uh, bashing about about four minutes of screen time. Yeah, this is a a Bill hit job. All this stuff. Your takeaway. You watched it. What what, what stands out to you? Man, I really feel like it could have been a 20-episode series, honestly. I mean, there's so much to cover, and I think people already lived through the football. It's it's great for me even to see some of the stuff when I wasn't there before I got there to, you know, see some of the stuff that went on. And, and you hear the stories, and you hear from, you know, older guys, you know, this is what happened. And, you know, it's, it was intense. I watched it with my wife this today. She's like, wow, this is like what you lived through. And I, I was like, yeah, this is – I mean, people don't realize. And, and I think the one thing that I take away is – guys who were on those teams take a lot of pride in being on those teams because it was tough. And we took, we took a lot of pride in, in being able to be tough and handle bill. And bill would say, look, you know, I, I credit you guys. I know I'm not easy. And, and, you know, you knew what you're getting yourself into. And for me, you know, they talked about fun. I was on a lot of organizations where we had fun on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Sunday came around and it wasn't fun, but I'll tell you what it was. It was miserable some days, but it was sure fun on Sundays. And I think if anything, it brought those teams close together in a way that, you know, closer than some college teams that I was on, um, you know, closer than any other team that I had been on in the NFL, um, because you went through it together. And I thought Danny's quote was great. Like we, we worked for Bill, but we played for Tom. And I think the one thing that you see is how endearing all of Tom's teammates are in, in this show and how they speak of him. And, um, you know, I think people, you know, look at it as are people bashing Bill. And the one thing that you know, really surprised me was how candid everybody was. And when you see a guy like Matt Slater say the things that he says, you know, for so long, we're so conditioned on how to deal with the media. How are you going to speak to the media? And you look at it and these are guys who were speaking freely without the pressure of, is my job at risk for saying, you know, what I feel and what I feel is the truth. And I think that was one of the biggest things that I witnessed, even all the way back to the Thai laws you know, the Rodney Harrisons, the the McGinnis, all the way through, you see guys who are speaking, you know, freely and, and, you know, you don't see anything that really isn't untrue. Brian Hoyer, as your wife said, you lived it. You saw <laughs> all this stuff firsthand. We really appreciate you sharing your insight with us here tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. All right. With the docuseries now fully released, the craft digs so to speak, at Belichick were pretty apparent, weren't they? He called Bill a real schmuck, quote-unquote, for Spygate. He mentioned how Bill thought Tommy was starting to lose it in 2014. And, of course, there were his comments we just showed you about the benching of Malcolm Butler. So, and he also called, he said, my head coach is a pain in the tush. He did use the word he tush. He said tush. Which I took note of. I tush actually push. wrote that one down. Tush. Tom, you feel as though the documentary was a little harsh on Bill? I think that... That's the prevailing opinion here in New England. This is a documentary that's done for the masses. And the drama of what happened with the New England Patriots is compelling Shakespearean. We've called it many times. So to tell that story, you're going to highlight the conflict. For a Patriots fan, it's been difficult to watch. And I think it's been difficult to watch because Bill Belichick was accepted and paid for to be an autocratic despot. Mm. And I think that Robert Kraft 
benefited greatly and the Patriots benefited greatly from Bill fulfilling that role. It's a violent, physical, merciless sport in which you're asking people to do unnatural things. It's one in which you have to bring people from very different backgrounds and get them to all row in the same direction. And if it meant that you had to be the enemy, Bill Belichick embraced that and was that. You know, it was a Vince Lombardi uh, quote or a quote from a player about Vince Lombardi. He treats us all as equals, like dogs. And I don't think that Bill treated them like dogs necessarily, but Bill was very good at doing it his way. If when things altered and the team went bad, if, those, if the commentary around all of this wasn't, but we understood this is how Bill was with Malcolm. We understood how this yeah. is how Bill was with Tom. We asked him to be that way for so long, it was hard for him to change. I just don't think enough allowances were made by the Crafts, Robert in particular, to say, I embraced it for a long time, and then I didn't. Right. I think that Robert wants to look like the oil in the engine here yes. that kept this thing going and stop it from seizing up, but not say that I, I really allowed Bill to be this because it benefited us. Uh, I've said this before, Phil and Tom. Look, Robert Kraft has lots of press conferences, or, uh, press uh, statements in drafts right now about, hey, this is what the Patriots have done since I've owned the team. Our family has done this. We've been to X amount of Super Bowls. We won this many division titles. You're a part. You're taking credit for it. But when it starts to dissolve and things happen, you try to distance yourself from it. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. You are a part of it. You are a part of some of the decisions that we agreed with and some of the dis decisions that we disagree with. And in his own words, he said that on camera. But I would say this overall quickly about this series. Matt Hamachek uh, had a great quote, had a great line when he asked, he, he told people, he'd asked them uh, to sit down for an interview, and they asked him how, he would be how they'd be perceived. He said, somewhere between a puff piece and what your worst enemy would say about you. Now, Bill Belichick got most of the worst enemy. Robert Kraft got most of the puff piece. I don't think any, is there anything negative said about Kraft? In here, anything? That's why I found the omission of 2019 interesting because a lot of people would look at Robert and say, where's the contract for Tom? Isn't that your decision, right. Robert? Isn't that part of the reason why Tom's not here? Yeah, anymore? I mean, and they he was really Pontius sort of Pilate. bypassed that whole season. He was Pontius Pilate in that instance, and Tom was looking and saying, Bill's just doing what Bill does, Robert. Where what are about you? you? Why, why have you always been here and now... Uh, <laughs> What is it? My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? <laughs> Let's keep on bringing up the biblical and the Shakespearean. Now you're at the cross. <laughs> so, I mean, it, that's now what he's Calvary. saying. Like a Pontius you went from Pilate. Pontius Pilate to Calvary. Go ahead. So he's looking for the guy, and he's nowhere to be seen. And I will say this, too, just again while we're at it with, with the craft stuff. You can't keep saying you never <laughs> stepped in on anything and have yes. nine different things in the series that you stepped right. in on. Right. Yeah. All my, I've out. never stepped in in 20 years except for this, 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 and this, and this. Other, otherwise, no, I wouldn't I have part of it. think you got it twice in the last two episodes. I told him he couldn't trade Tom, and I told him he had to get Alex back in the building. So that, those, were, those were two instances right there in the matter of 60 minutes of screen time where we saw Robert Kraft involve himself, which is his right. Michael, yep. right? That's he, right. He should have it's his had team. his say in a lot of these things. And look, I, I know a lot of people here, we wanted more football, but that really wasn't the purpose of it. They were trying to tell the story for people who didn't know the story. We know it. We know too much. And I think Brian Hoyer is right. For the, for the football people who are really into it and the, the, the nooks and crannies of it, we probably did need a 20-part 20, 20 series. Ten uh, focused on the drama is not quite enough for people in New England. But I think nationally, they got exactly what they were looking for. Phil, do you think that this will damage the relationship between Bill Belichick and Robert Kraft and make it more difficult for Bill to come back here for events? I don't know. Yes. It, it might. Yes. It might. And I wonder, too, now, what is Bill Belichick's response? Do we get a response yes. from him? Does he come out with his own docuseries? Or is it a book, Michael? What is it that I, we I hear think there, there will be some responses coming. It might be uh, NFL films. It might be some subtweets or whatever. But he's not going to just sit there and take this. And I wonder, and this is for a discussion for another day because we're running out of time, what would have happened if Bill had come back? If Bill had come back, and, and was, you're dealing with this? And that was the intention. This was not dropped after Bill was released. They wanted Bill to be continue to be the head coach through this year. They didn't want 4-13. and 13. It's fascinating to watch. And the other thing is, Bill did have the opportunity to say whatever he wanted to in that time and yeah. defend himself, and he passed on it. And he did. Uh, we want to thank you two because you guys saw all of this stuff from the very, very beginning. How lucky are we to get the insight that we did from Michael Hawley and Tom Carney. Thanks for being with us throughout the Dynastic Post Show. We appreciate it.